This is Everything 80s Podcast, episode 13. Was the Cabbage Patch Kid a stolen idea worth millions? Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast brought to you by Everything80sPodcast.com. I'm Jamie and today we're looking at something I'm sure you remember, the whole Cabbage Patch Kids phenomenon, but I didn't know half of what went into this whole thing. So they're obviously a quintessential 1980s toy, arguably one of the hottest toys of all time, but was it a stolen idea? They came out in 1983 and... In case you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a soft sculpted doll that created one of the hottest toy demands of all time, but not without controversy because it looks like it was stolen from an earlier type of doll. So that's what we're going to look at. And before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, I should be there. Okay, let's get right into it. So I probably like you if you're familiar with this, remember the whole Cabbage Patch Kids craze of the 1980s. I remember my sister owning at least one of them. And like I said, it seems like a pretty straightforward story until you look deeper into it. There's this alleged stolen idea. There's the original toy craze that caused stampeding. It might have led to what we now know as Black Friday. Also, it may have also created Festivus. So you'll want to listen to this one. So here's the early iteration of the Cabbage Patch Kid. And this story may start in the 1970s, actually, with a lady named Martha Nelson Thomas. She was an artist and creator from Kentucky who liked to create and make her own dolls. She wanted to make something that had more of a likeness to an actual baby and one that wasn't like a hard porcelain doll that looks like it's going to murder you in your sleep, um, those type things. And, and that those tend to be more for display rather than, you know, actual playing with. So she's a shy person and her best way of communicating with strangers was through her work with these dolls. She ended up going to school in Louisville and instead of being like all the painters and sculptors she found herself around, she liked working with soft sculpture. Her interest was on like I said, improving on the basic doll design. She thought there could be more done with it. So this allowed her to come up with what she called Doll Baby, which had these softer features. It had more baby-like proportions. Um, if you go to the show notes today, that's where the whole like blog and article is, and there's also all the pictures um, to do with this. So you can see some of these original Doll Baby pictures on here. So that is everything 80s podcast slash 13. If you're listening on YouTube, there'll be a link down below, but that's where you can just see everything else um, I'm talking about here. So with regard to these uh, doll babies, like I said, they they look like what a Cabbage Patch kid would end up looking. But, you know, now like with more of these softer <clears throat> features, she would also spend her time shopping for outfits and accessories to give each one their own unique style. And this was basically an expression of herself through the dolls. So she would start selling these things at craft shows and fairs and these doll babies start to become popular. And then there's one last thing she does that makes them more unique. She gave each one an adoption certificate. So that's obviously going to come up in a bit. So now this comes up to Xavier Roberts. So during the time Martha was basically creating these doll babies to allow them to be adopted, you know, at all these shows, a guy named Xavier Roberts saunters through one of them in 1976. He bought up a few of them and then he ended up selling or adopting them out at his own shop that he had in Georgia. And then he was also selling them for a pretty steep price compared to what Martha was. And this obviously alarmed and concerned her. So even though she was a shy person, she actually confronted Xavier Roberts and ended up taking them back. He then allegedly said that if he couldn't sell her dolls, he would sell some just like it. And he sure as hell would do that. Xavier Roberts would also say that he studied soft sculpture in college and he had an interest in making 
softer versions of dolls. This is what he would say in future interviews. So who knows how much of a background he actually had in it. Um, Roberts knew he had something unique on his hands with what he had created in air quotes. And he decided to go more the mass production route. He turned to a manufacturing company in Hong Kong to make a cheaper version of the doll baby, but one that still retained a similar appearance. So they're not technically cabbage patch kids yet because he was selling them for his own company and they weren't exactly the doll that you're familiar with yet. So, but what's his side of this whole story? According to Roberts, when he was 21, he had become good at quilting, which he had learned from his mom. He created his own fabric sculptures that he called little people, which I think is not offensive, but this was the seventies. His little people were also not offered for sale, but instead you would pay an adoption fee and each doll came with its own individual adoption certificate. So who knows which side of the story is true. It's not like two people couldn't come up with this adoption fee and certificate idea, but it's just interesting. Now he had seen her doll and then started selling a very similar version in the near future. So who knows the one thing, the one huge thing is that Robert's, brought a whole new name to whatever these dolls had once been called. He called them Cabbage Patch Kids, and he had come up with a backstory that he says he had made up when he was around 10 years old and that it was him following what he called Bunny Bee, whatever the hell that is, behind a waterfall and into a magic cabbage patch. In the cabbage patch is where you would find the Cabbage Patch Kids being born, and then they could live in Babyland General in Cleveland, Georgia, until they were adopted. Yikes. (laughs) I didn't have those same, whatever. Okay, one last thing here, though, is Roberts patented the doll in 1978, and he would do something unique to each one. Do you remember his name would be branded right into the ass cheek of each doll? This was essentially putting a copyright on the doll for protection, you know, that looked like it was branded. So that was very strategic because maybe he was worried about someone doing what he had done and taking an idea. Who knows? Okay. So here comes the launch of the Cabbage Patch Kid. Roberts owned a company called Original Appalachian Artworks that was first making those little people that he said, and then he began to license a small version of them to a toy company called Coleco in 1982. And then this is when he had started to call them Cabbage Patch Kids. Um, and Coleco started to change a few things up too. They would give the dolls a larger round vinyl head and they would make the bodies out of soft fabric. So I I think this is all production um, centered. So for the the first two years, the production came from the Far East. And I'm not sure if that's just because he had been making his earlier dolls in Hong Kong for mass production and it was easy just to keep it over here. I mean, the, the timeline is pretty hazy on all this, so it's hard to pin down what was done and at what time. But from 1982 to 1989, a majority of them would end up being made in Amsterdam, New York. And here's an interesting thing. Despite where they were being made, the smart idea was to include variation, which goes back to some of those original baby dolls. There were nine different types of heads made and they were computer matched with the bodies. And this helped to ensure that each doll would be different. You could have a huge amount of variation and different combinations this way. So I don't know if you remember Cabbage Patch Kids at all, but I distinctly remember how unique each one seemed to be. It it wasn't a mass version of one product like, um, tickle me Elmo or whatever, but one that you could pick based on your individual taste. And I think this is where a lot of the success lies. Kids felt like they were getting something specific and customized to them. It it wasn't like every kid had the same one. Everyone got something unique and ultimately more special. And this ended up being what would turn out to be a brilliant marketing ploy. And this leads us into the Cabbage Patch Kids craze of 1983 before Before there was Black Friday, there were the Cabbage Patch Kid riots. Again, I'm not sure if you remember this or not, but this is what's considered the first real toy craze. There's always been in-demand toys, but not one that led to people getting injured, uh, tramplings, 
broken bones. This hadn't really ever happened before. So Cabbage Patch Kids really hit the market full on for the first time in the fall and the winter of 1983. And the demand that Christmas was immediately through the roof. It, it's crazy to think how powerful commercials were back then. Today, it is so hard. If you think how hard, like to get someone's attention with ads, there's so many things vying for your focus. And that just think on TV, how many different options and channels and whether you have a different cable packages or whatever. There's so much to see and watch. And then if you get into any streaming services or the time you spend on your phone or in public or like to get ads in front of people is so hard these days. Um, you know, now people are moving, companies are moving more into YouTube. Like they want to go where people are um, streaming more things and people aren't watching a lot of live TV. And, and so, so the idea is still getting ads in front of people. It's just the medium keeps changing around often. So if you think back in the eighties, there was basically just three networks. So you had a very good chance at capturing the attention of the majority of the viewing public. And if you put your commercials on during kids prime time like after school or saturday morning cartoons you're guaranteed that pretty much every kid who's watching a tv is going to see those commercials it must have been so much easier to market back then if you think you're guaranteed that people are going to see them today you have no idea what the impact is going to be like whether you're going to have to advertise on facebook or youtube or regular tv or but trying to find your audience is so much harder also when you're catering to kids and presenting these cute dolls in a creative and effective way, there's really no way they're not going to want one. It, it, like any big toy, you just show other kids using them, have kids imagine themselves in that situation, and it's just foolproof. It's always worked. It probably always will work. Even as a like a boy, I thought these were cool and wanted one, as did other kids I know, just because you're seeing everyone playing with them on TV and in cartoons, just as, or like commercials, just the same way we'd see GI Joe commercials or transformers. You wanted to be that kid playing with that toy. So now you've got the perfect storm of an in-demand toy, low inventory and Christmas. That's the trifecta right there. Most stores were stocking around 200 to 500 of the dolls, but stores were getting on average thousands and thousands of visitors. So people are trampling, they're clawing, they're biting. There's stories of customers carrying baseball bats. It's just, you know, what parents will do for their kids is unbelievable. Again, go on um, the show notes today. So the whole blog on the website, everything80spodcast.com slash 13. I've got some of those commercials um, showing all this going down in 1983. Sorry, like news features and stuff like that. Or, or look them up yourself if you're on YouTube or, or whatever and just look up Cabbage Patch Kids Craze in 83. And you can see this, um, <laughs> it's, you know, so some stores had to resort to handing out purchase tickets to control crowds. They were given to the first several hundred customers, but you know, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people are going to leave empty handed. There's a story of two DJs in Milwaukee causing absolute havoc by, by joking that a B 29 bomber was going to drop a load of dolls to people who held up captures mitts sorry, catcher's mitts and American Express cards. So tons of people actually believe this joke and showed up at the county stadium in this deathly cold weather uh, wind chill day. So <laughs> kind of like the 80s version of War of the Worlds when Orson Welles did it. So think I, I was also thinking of the uh, Office episode when Dwight buys all the Princess Unicorn dolls and he would you know, put up advertisements and people coming in to buy them at horrific markups, knowing what parents will do to get the in-demand toy. So I mentioned Festivus before. So that this one might be a bit of a stretch, but bear with me. If I'm hoping you're a fan of Seinfeld, and if you are, you're very aware of Festivus. It's the holiday created by Frank Costanza, who'd become sick of all the religious and commercial aspects that came from Christmas. And he wanted to create a Festivus for the rest of us. So the origin of him feeling this way has to do with the day he went to purchase a doll for his son. Quoting, many Christmases ago, I went to buy a doll for my son. I reached for the last one they had, but so did another man. As I rained blows upon him, I realized there had to be another way. 
I realize it's hard to pinpoint if this was 1983, as this would put the character of George well past college age, but based on the Costanzas, this might not be an issue. So there's the chance Frank would have known about the Cabbage Patch doll craze and thought it was fitting for his son, no matter what stage in life his son may be. But I digress, just my own theory. So now here's the continued popularity of the Cabbage Patch kid. So Coleco obviously has gold on their hands here. All the dolls were unique, and from a business aspect, it was a money-making just bonanza as they could also sell a crap load of clothes and accessories and all that stuff. And this, I don't I vaguely remember that the dolls themselves weren't cheap. They sold for around $30, which converted for today is around 75 bucks. I mean, that's relatively steep, I guess. So 83 and 84 were huge years for cabbage patch kids. And by 1985, they had made over $600 million. But you know, as all fads do, the novel novelty begins to wear off. Um, by 86, the sales were only around $250 million. Still amazing, you know, and again, converted for today, that's, what are we getting close to like $550 million? You know, it's amazing um, return. But they just, they, you know, it's hard to create the interest that they once had. You know, even, I don't know if you remember this, like scalpers would be selling these things. They'd be obviously knockoffs whenever there's any big type of toy. And then other companies would be making their own versions, sort of knockoff things. I remember that we got one of those, but I remember that was a big thing that people would actually be scalping these dolls. Uh, so now these people are feeling the pinch because they have huge inventories of a doll that people aren't interested in as much anymore. They put a lot of money into it and, and it's starting to fade away. So Coleco tries to salvage things by bringing out more, accessory, more accessories and novelty Cabbage Patch kids like talking dolls and ones that would play kazoos and all that sort of stuff. I'm not sure if you remember those or not. So Coleco's having a rough go of it with some other failing toy lines. And at this time, original Appalachian Artworks, which was that first company, bought back the rights to Cabbage Patch Kids. Coleco would end up going bankrupt not long after that. So then Hasbro would step in and start selling the dolls and began marketing them more to younger age children. They, they tried to take things in a new direction. The problem is Hasbro never really got back the hype around Cabbage Patch Kids. So then Mattel throws their hat in the ring in 1994, and they got the rights to the dolls. They made smaller sized dolls for a while until Toys R Us took over from Mattel in 2003, and they started making super sized Cabbage Patch Kids dolls. Then in 2004, the ownership was again taken over by a company called Play Along Toys. Then Play Along Toys was acquired by Jack Specific in 2011. And to finish this whole thing off, a company called Wicked Cool Toys is the final owner of Cabbage Patch Kids, which I assume is based out of Boston or something. If they're called Wicked Cool Toys, they also own the rights to Teddy Ruxpin. I've got a whole podcast on that if you want to listen to that one too. So these dolls really get around, it looks like. And then here's a kind of side thing here and a, a episode, another episode I've done all about the Garbage Pail Kids. And again, that's a other fascinating story. I had no idea what went into that whole thing and the controversy and issues. So check that episode out as well. But I, I loved Garbage Pail Kids. I was right in that right wheelhouse when those things came out. It was a blatant roasting of the original dolls and they had some of the best trading cards ever released. I still have some of them somewhere. I've got a huge old card collection. They're somewhere in there. They were originally just, the Garbage Pail Kids were originally just intended to be a Topps trading card set, but they were a massive, massive hit. So they were so big that it spawned a Garbage Pail Kids movie, which I was not allowed to see, but was also considered one of the worst movies ever made. That's a whole other story. I cover this all in the other episode. It, it just... It, it's funny, like it has a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It, I mean, but you can't blame any of those studios. They had to crank out something that was quick while this franchise was hot, like the Emoji movie or the Angry Birds movie that came out like two years after that was popular. There's also an animated series that was created but was actually postponed due to parental complaint. And then... The, the Garbage Pail Kids cards would be banned in schools. And I vaguely remember this. I remember keeping them in a pencil case I had in my desk. They were considered a distraction. So they weren't 
outright banned, but they were definitely frowned upon. So either way, Garbage Pail Kids is a massive hit, but guess who didn't like it? You know, Xavier Roberts, obviously. And in a very ironic scenario, Roberts would sue Tops for $30 million for copyright infringement. And that's pretty ballsy if you think about what he had allegedly done. So we'll wrap it up here. Looking back at the legacy of this whole thing, it's quite an interesting journey uh, coming from the 70s into what it became. And I'm not sure what to make of everything Xavier Roberts said as far as saying he created the Cabbage Patch Kids straight up. I think he, I think he definitely jumped on the work that Martha Nelson Thomas had created, and created. Roberts himself ended up saying how her dolls influenced his Cabbage Patch Kids. How much was influenced and how much of it was a blatant ripoff is open for interpretation, but it actually ended up going to court. Thomas settled out of court in 1985 for an undisclosed amount, but her main thing she stated, though, that the whole or- ordeal was how upset she was at the corruption of the dolls. She resented how they were mass marketed commercial products. But looking at this, I have to say that millions and millions of kids worldwide loved and enjoyed these dolls, which was her original goal. So I think that's something to take away from it. She's got to be happy that however all this happened, it reached so many people and it made so many kids happy. Either way, There may be no more definitive toy than 1980s, and it's got a story and history that are as as unique as the dolls themselves. So I'll wrap it up here. Hopefully you found this interesting. I did just researching back. Pretty crazy story on the history of one of the most famous toys ever made. So thanks for listening. Again, make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. I'm anywhere you find podcasts. I should be there. If you really like the show, leave it a rating and review. That way more people get to see it. Also, if you wanted to see more the in-depth and pictures and more detail with the whole blog article, that's the show notes for today. So that's everything80spodcast.com slash 13. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, there'll be a link down below. While you're While you're there, you can subscribe as well. All that good stuff. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks for listening. See you later.